Kia ora Aotearoa. I begin today by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'm presenting from their land today in Nam, known as Melbourne, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I want to start with a PowerPoint. I can just get round to it. Um, how to get cost, cut costs and get published, the mystery behind Mary Fortune, W.W. Mary Fortune and her 1871 The Detectives album. And I shall just start my slideshow. And um, so what I'll be talking about is this book, The Detectives album. It's 1871, my typo. Uh, one of two surviving copies, the one is at, at the British Library and the other is at the Mitchell, and it has significance as a very rare item um, in bibliography, crime, and also Australiana, and it was re basically it was reprinted from the Australian Journal um, as, as part of a series which is the longest early known in early crime fiction and which ran for 40 years from 1868 to um, 1908. And the publishers were the printers Clarkson and Messina. Now this book, The Detectives Album, is small and rather, rather unprepossessing, also foxed, um, but it's, we don't know what the print run was, but likely small given the um, limited nature of the seven Austral colonies book publishing. Um, field but how much so there's only two copies how much is it worth I recently heard a figure of sixty thousand dollars and it lives in a safe at the Mitchell another extraordinary thing about the book is that it's written by an author with a large following it was largely unknown to her readers wife Wanda was the pseudonym Mary Fortune was the name behind it and WW was the what she um, was the pseudonym used for the detective's album, which was entered as true police stories by a real policeman um, in, a male, in a male persona. It's the same form used by Colin Doyle, a series of short stories with the same protagonist. I was sorry to um, interrupt you just there. Are you um, sharing your slides right now? Because we, we can't see anything. Ah, um, well, that's interesting. They should be um, sharing my slides, but okay. Okay. I don't... Um, have you clicked the share screen button down the bottom? It's a green okay. button with an I, arrow on it. Okay, just hold on. Escape. Um, so if you look in the Zoom call, yep. uh, underneath, um, yep. at the bottom in the middle, it just say, okay. it's a share screen and it's a, a green button. Yep. Now, can, can you see that? Uh, it's coming. Yep, Is it's it good. And if you just start the slideshow and make it a bit bigger for everyone. Okay. All right. We're going. We're on our way. Okay. Start from first slide. Here is the book. The detective yeah, that's good. Album. Um, sorry about that. Um, I've had a hell of a day with technical issues. Now, she was... One factor of the pseudonyms was that it shielded Fortune's identity and she was a bit of a wild character, a bohemian who was a, bigam who was a bigamist and who um, had an illegitimate, an illegitimate child. It protected her reputation from her readers. But the subterfuge enabled her to survive in a very tough freelance market. She lived until 1911 and she outlived her contemporaries. Marcus Clark, Henry Kendall, and Adam Lindsay Gordon, both a pioneering female journalist and a pioneering woman crime writer. Now, the detective's album, the book, is extraordinary for two other reasons. The circumstances under which it appeared and its method of production was very hard, as you would have seen from the abstract, to bring out a book in Australia. Um, and the alternative was publication in England. This was, a, this was unusual in being published in Australia. Now, just looking at the at the um, public publication scene, then you can see the canonical boys: um, Marcus Clark, 
um, the poets Henry Kendall and Adam Lindsay Gordon, and they alternated between George Robertson, no relation to the later George Robertson of Angus and Robertson, and Clarsen and Messina. And um, Clarsen and Messina were jobbing printers before starting the Australian Journal. And one of the factors that had to be taken into account was cost of paper and also how it was produced. So until the 1890s, it usually meant a subscription list, which was the author effectively crowdfunding from their moneyed friends or publishing on commission, which meant the author paid for the initial printing costs and publicity. If the book was a success, the publisher then shared the profits. Rarer was when the publisher bought the copyright from the author taking all the risks and if the book sold all the profits. And this, that happened with Henry Kendall's, George Robertson's Leaves from Australian Forests. Robertson took the risks, risk and lost 90 pounds. Um, with Adam Lindsay Gordon, the cost of printings proved fatal fatal to him he went out and shot himself uh, the day before Bush Ballads was published and um, a very sad end but let's consider Mary Fortune the the class and Messina were called straightforward commercial men and so they're unlikely to have taken the risk um, so she would have paid how much would it cost her and we do have some figures from that period and from Adam Lindsay Gordon Bush Ballads 250 copies was 31 pounds and a thousand copies was 49 pounds. So Mary Fortune would have paid more for that, her book being slightly larger, or was it? Um, and, and the other abiding mystery is how on earth did she, did she pay for it? Because at the time she was um, the most published woman in the, in the Australian colonies, but as a woman was paid less. Um, she also, in her journalism complained which is very autobiographical complained about being short of money housing difficulties she was living in a um, home for governesses charitable home for governesses and also had a significant drinking problem which in 1877 1870 saw her locked for a week in jail so how did she pay for it um an answer comes from printing the, comparing the printed text of the stories in the magazine and the book itself. So this is part of the process. Um, this is the detective's album, the book, which I'm then comparing with the Australian Journal um, version, which was double, which was two columns, the book's one column. Um, as you can see, they're identical in in books and journal. The only copies is that only change is that they've made two columns of type have made into one. Now, how did this happen? I asked Karen Florence, who's a well-known letterpress printer, and she reckoned that um, basically the Clarsen and Messina had just reprinted from the same type setting. Karen says, I reckon she would have asked the printers if they could do a run on after they did the journal. It wouldn't have taken more than physically moving the same lines into different blocks. Um, and um, so if that happened, if she did a special run on, and I must say to say that the easiest way of proving that the same type is used is to look for damage type um, in both versions, which indeed turned out to be in exactly the same place. So it's the same type. Um, but the book would have been printed piecemeal over a seven month period as the stories were printed. And this is the Australian Journal's covers. And we can see from October 1870, the second book in the series is, um, second story in the series um, is actually quite late in the Australian Journal. Uh, Fortune did not get on with Marcus Clark and he seems to have been trying to get rid of her, but by January 1871, his natural life, his celebrated serial, is leading the serial, but Mary Fortune's The Detective's Album is the second item in. So there's some sort of titanic battle going on behind the scenes. The Detective's Album was very, was very popular, but seven month period did this happen that they, that they did a print run and then waited until the next month did another. Now, such reuse of type did occur in 19th century British publishing as a quick means of following a popular serialization with a cheaply 
produced book as with Dickens and Thackeray, but as far as I know, it hasn't, I have, do not know of another example in Australasian publishing. It did occur in newspapers. Uh, Rosemary Foxton has established that, that with Catherine Martin's The Silent Sea, um, the same type was used for the weekly and the and the daily instalments in basically in the, in the publications associated with the Adelaide Register's office. And the type was shifted and reformatted. Now, one of these problems is um, that certainly Fortune was familiar with the AJ's printery. From her 1872, The Midnight Story, the Midnight Burial, it was approaching the time when copy would be expected at the offices of the Australian Journal, and I had not found time to arrange my experiences for the compositive hands, compositor's hands. And basically, she's talking about the compositor rather than the editor, um, and which indicates that when she, if she was close to, dev, to deadline, she simply went straight to the, straight to the printers. Um, another indication is that um, a very clear marginal note to herself in the story, A Woman's Revenge, actually got into the AJ uh, and into the book itself. Um, and it suggests lack of sub editing. And what it was was I had got my detective's album card, my detective's card, only three months memo to ask DOC what a detective card is which is which there's a memo which reveals who her sources were in the police. In this case, Detective O'Callaghan, Thomas O'Callaghan, who was an efficient but also corrupt detective who'd become police commissioner and also feature in Frank Hardy's novel, Power Without Glory. So again, an indication that the same type was used. Um, in Fortune's later story, Under the Lamp, a corpse is identified as a printer by loose type from his pocket and a scene actually in, in the, it occurs in, the, in his print works. So did a printer tip her off as to how she might turn her stories into the book and significantly save on production costs by avoiding compositive fees? For an author who is very much on, on the bread line, it was perfect manner for heaven. But for such a reprint to happen, you had to have the author was publishing their texts with the one magazine. Secondly, that magazine had to survive, not easy in colonial publishing. And thirdly, serial and book had to have the same publisher or associated printery, but it cut the costs of book printing significantly. Um, now, another way in which this, I'll just, this is basically some of the, pro, some of the processes of printing. Um, now, this is, hadn't changed very much over since Gutenberg. One of the advances was stereotyping, which was a means and by a flong, and that is making an impression of the type and then creating a, and then creating type, and then creating metal printing from using that, the flong as a model. And we know the Australian Journal did this for only their third issue, they said, in 1865, persons may at all time depend on being able to procure to order from the agents any back numbers of the Australian Journal as the stereotype plates were kept for this purpose. And thanks to Paul Eggert for, for reminding me of this. Now, it wasn't cheap, but it was still an advance on having to reset a book's type as happened with the, when the, the Mystery of the Handsome Cab by Fergus Hume took off like a rocket and needed to be reprinted, but the type had been redistributed. Now that the AJ used stereotyping as a key to its commercial survival, um, and that it printed both in Sydney and Melbourne, and it seems that they sent the stereotype from Melbourne to Sydney on a coastal steamer and later and later via the um, and and later via the by the railways, was this was the detective's album unique in in colonial publishing? Not at all. Another writer of the Australian Journal was a poet, as non-canonical as Mary Fortune, and even more forgotten. William Carlton Jr. was the son of a novelist of the same name, a major figure in Ireland. Um, he emigrated and published poetry for some 14 years. He worked for Melbourne magazines, 
Um, he's been recorded as being indolent, but he produced quite a lot of poems. And this book, The Warden of Galway by Class and Messina in 1868. Um, the best review it got said that it wasn't quite up to the standard, standard of Henry Kendall, which is actually high praise. The worst by Alexander that it, Sutherland, that it didn't contain any poetry, but that's unfair. There's a very interesting long poem on about William Buckley, which uh, I, which is on the screen. And so a high quality production, which was produced by subscription, and you can see in the Australian Journal, the second column, an advertisement in which they're calling for subscribers with the, with the, with the, for the volume, which a price of five shillings and those who wish to subscribe will please send in their, their, send in their names with the number of copies they require and when they, and when they had enough, they would reprint. Um, sadly, a list of these subscribers were not published in the book. Clarkson and Massena did advertise the warden heavily in the magazine and even published a laudatory review in their own pages, but not for Fortune. Um, she only had one advertisement and no reviews at all anywhere, but she needed the book for other reasons. Her only surviving son, teenage boy George, was arrested in, a, arrested in 1871 for theft and sent to the um, industrial schools, which is basically preparatory for the workhouse, preparatory for prison, and he did in fact end up to be a habitual criminal, but she's trying to get him out of, out of the industrial school, and for that she needs to produce her, prove her respectability, and I think she produced the book because, she, because of its cultural capital that she needed to show her significance, and that she was on the side of the police because she was writing stories with a detective as a hero. And unfortunately, um, it didn't work. Uh, something went wrong with her application. It was initially approved and then it was rescinded, but the book exists. Um, and to pay for it, she started a serialized novel, The Bush Ranger's Autobiography in the Australian Journal, which suggests she was paying off something of a printing debt. And it ran concurrently with the later stages of Marcus Clark's His Natural Life. Um, some concluding comments. Fortune and Carlton Jr. were lucky in able to be, being able to exploit a, a publishing loophole that their work had already appeared in print form from a print workshop which could accommodate magazine and book publication using the same typeface via reuse of type or stereotyping. I am convinced that Carlton's book involves stereotyping. I'm not quite so sure about Fortune. Others writers were not so lucky. Adam Lindsay Gordon famously shot himself. Um, had his work appeared exclusively in the AJ Australian Journal, the costs would have been significantly less and his debts would have been less. He might have survived and even, and even saved some money. And on that note, I'll conclude. <laughs>